Thank you very much for the kind words. Thank you for the invitation and the lovely lunch. Canada's first and longest land campaign was in Italy. The Canadian Army fought in brutal terrain, harsh heat, cold snow, mud, over a nearly two year uh, Allied battle across Sicily and the Italian Peninsula. They were facing highly skilled and devoted, cunning and experienced German forces at a cost more than 26,000 Canadians. Yet, they're often referred to as the Forgotten Theater. This past summer in Normandy, they got much of the international attention and press while there is no mention of the Leary Valley battles, which of course was the most violent and costly of the lengthy Mediterranean theater. It's been that way ever since Normandy actually, which is why I accepted the invitation of presenting that campaign within this 30 minute presentation. Because I personally know from a lot of the friends and, and colleagues that I've come to know over 42 years, I know what it's like to have the value of a soldier's military service minimized. Uh, for your information, uh, if you look at the slides, that's the Price of Peace monument in Ortona. That's a Canadian financed monument. And then to the right is the Morrow River Cemetery. I haven't seen any Italian Second World War monuments. So a lot of the monuments dedicated to the Canadians is because of a Canadian consciousness. We were severely behind the power curve prior to Sicily. The British Expeditionary Force's efforts are collapsed on account of the crumbled uh, French Army, which was supposedly at the time the largest and best trained army in continental Europe. There was so much momentum against the British that they couldn't make it to Norway in time to head off the Germans. So that was very important because of all those year-round ice-free ports. For their very survival, they had to win the Battle of Britain and the Battle of Atlantic. So what were we doing there parts of the Canadian Army, what were we doing there as early as December 1939? Well, that downed German plane is a bit of a hint. We were there to help preserve uh, Britain from getting overrun by the Germans. And again, given that, that momentum, it was a real threat. Those are Canadian soldiers, by the way. We were extraordinarily well received by the British people. Uh, to the left is a picture of the Loyal Edmonton Regiment's color party. And to the right is the King reviewing Canadian troops. The British hierarchy was a little skeptical about the Canadians at first and actually had designs on using them for reinforcement troops. But Canada wasn't going to have any of that. It would work against our national pride and prestige, especially given what we had done in the first war. We were not about to undo that. And so we decided we're going to, you're not piecemealing our troops, we're going to maintain formation integrity. And of course, it wouldn't be long after we got to Italy that the Brits were over that skepticism and very impressed with the Canadian troops, as were the German forces. Getting it together took a long time, and then once the Battle of Britain and Atlantic was won, we could then focus on um, individual training. Individual training is very, very important throughout our stay in Britain, uh, not only to better prepare for what would have been an invasion, uh, had we not won the Battle of Britain and Atlantic, but also for further operations. If we were going to get off that island and take the fight to continental Europe, we had to focus more on individual training. And then, of course, um, training is always good for a soldier's morale. And the harder and the more you train them, they're less apt to get in trouble in the local pubs. <laughs> now we're leading up to the Mediterranean campaign. Canada by now is building up its formations. You're now getting more regiments so that you can form brigades and then from brigades now you can start working on a division. So there's more troops piling in, there's more equipment coming in from Canada. Uh, to the left you'll see pictures of Bren gun carriers. There were thousands of these things made and they were used for everything from carrying troops to towing artillery pieces. So the training intensifies. Um, tanks are getting brewed up. Troops are actually getting killed. That's how intensive the training becomes. Canadian officers and NCOs are shipped off to North Africa to fit or to fight rather with the British forces to gain that essential combat leadership experience. <clears throat> and fortunately, they're fighting with Montgomery's 8th Army, 
whom he would serve with throughout the Sicily and Italian campaign. What happens is, is uh, late June, the Canadians depart Britain in order to link up with the invasion of Armada of about 3,000 Allied ships. We lose three ships due to a submarine attack, losing 58 troops, about 500 vehicles, and a number of guns. Turn your attention to the uh, map of Sicily. This is where we invade. You'll see in red, this is where the British forces, and that includes Canada, and this is Patton's army, and this is the route they take. What happens is uh, the Canadian-Italian campaign starts 10 July. We hit Sugar Beach, and uh, the landing beach that we are at covers about 60 miles. Uh, the Italian defenders are quickly overwhelmed and the Canadians advance on Pacino and of course its strategic airport. Nightfall saw most of the Canadian units either on or past every initial objective. Seven men had died and 25 others were wounded. On July 11, the Canadians were delayed, not as much by enemy opposition, but rather by thousands of Italian troops wanting surrender. The Canadians followed an inland route that protected the British 8th Army's left flank up along the eastern coastline towards Catania, and Catania is at about the midway point. In fact, eventually that's where Monty would be headquartered as the Allies progressed up the island. And of course the idea is to make it ultimately to the Strait of Messina, because that's the narrowest strait between Sicily and mainland Italy. With the Italian army's rapid collapse, several German divisions have to hurriedly establish a series of defense lines. And the fighting becomes more and more increasingly tough as they hit Gramicelli, and Gramicelli is in around this area here. Once they get to Leon Forte here, it's really tough. This here is Mount Etna, so the uh, road there from Mount Etna to Leon Forte, that's where the bulk of the fighting is because at this time the Germans are pushing north and they're making their way towards uh, Messina to make their escape. The Germans would typically have a very intense fortified line of defense and then they would withdraw and that would be a precursor uh, for that, that, those tactics throughout the Italian campaign. Um, this entailed heavily entrenched fortifications set it on a ideal defensive terrain of uh, ridges, mountains, and rivers. And of course, when the line was breached, they would quickly withdraw to another. Just so that you know, these are extraordinarily professional, well-experienced troops. Battle-hardened, because don't forget, this is now 43. They've been at it for years now. At Leon Forte, the 2nd Infantry Brigade spends a night of house-to-house -house fighting. Meanwhile, the Hastings and Prince Edward Regiment carry out a nighttime ascent of a 904 meter high Monte Osoro to surprise the German defenders. You're going to see the picture, you're going to see pictures of the train. You imagine taking an objective that's almost a kilometer high? I might take a seat right here and now and uh, my, my heartbeat's increased. That, that's, that's incredible. By the first week of August, the Germans are caught in a closing vice of American, British and Canadian units. By 17 August, the Germans have evacuated. With the landing in Sicily, the tide turns. Though many, many Germans escape, it's a huge success because it ensures the Allied use of uh, Allied airfields. It frees up the sea lane in the Mediterranean. And by 3 September 43, the Italian government surrenders, but that doesn't eradicate fascist resistance and it's not gonna be the end of Mussolini. The Canadians are well integrated with the British Army. Italy is next. The um, monument that you see here is an initiative due to uh, PPCLI Captain Sidney Frost. That's the only sign of the Canadians landing in Sicily. Interesting character, Sidney Frost. He represents the difference between how the Canadians and British operated as compared to our American allies. When the Canadians or British liberated a town or a city, they would appoint an officer to become the mayor. And their job was to restore civil authority, see if they could repair the, uh, the infrastructure. The Italians are in sad shape, very, very hungry. And you talk to a lot of Canadian veterans of that campaign, they were just awe-stricken by the poverty that they saw. Whereas the Americans would pick 
somebody that looked like they had their act together in haste so that they could move on with the war. In part, that's how the Mafia got reinstalled in Sicily through that process. But um, Sidney Frost maintained a great rapport with the citizens of Espica, and he would continually go there and he's made an honorary citizen of Espica. What you got here, is, this, is, uh, this is Sugar Beach right here. And these Canadian soldiers are in Pacino, and you can see they're not very comfortable. The heat is just killer, and they're probably missing the more cooler British climbs by now. And uh, of course, now they've got to change their combat uniform. They go from the more continental Europe heavy wool type of uniform to a more canvas type of uh, arid type of uh, uniform. This is the terrain. This is what they faced from Leon Forte all the way to Adreno at Mount Etna. Now, on the right picture, you can see the highway that provides that access events. It's the only route direct from Leon Forte to Adreno. And once you hit Mount Etna, you're just you're pretty well off the by the coast there, right? Now you can't fit a division on the one road, so that leaves this terrain here for them to conduct their advance to contact until they come into contact with the Germans. And then, and then they gotta take this town on this hill. It's very, very typical. It's just absolutely killer. As they're winning, they're learning. On the left is a picture of a mule train. And it, it's also a sign of the times too. If you look at our population, fortunately there wasn't a humongous divide as there is today between rural and urban populations. I don't see a bunch of city boys ramping up a mule train. Uh, to the right, you've got the members of the medical corps. All kinds of initiatives are taking place. Uh, for example, the medevac system is just slick, slick, slick. They've developed a collection point at the unit. They go to brigade collection points, division collection points, and then from there, field hospitals like a mash. <clears throat> um, penicillin comes into use by the Canadian Army in late 43. At this time, it's still issued on a very experimental basis. It's very, very expensive. Still a ways to learn in how to make a pure, better quality penicillin and, and how to administer it. The Canadian Army has a research unit set up throughout the Italian campaign. This is a Jira, and again, that's, that's another city that had to get taken. All these cities go back to the medieval period. It, it only made sense back in the medieval period, build high take the commanding ground. So that's another example of what they had to take. And to the right, it's uh, Ajira. And we can talk more about the cemeteries during the Q&A if you'd like. This is uh, Tormina. And Tormina was used as a bit of an R&R &R center for the Canadian troops after the major fighting was done. And it gives them a chance to recharge your batteries before they hit mainland Italy. Right here is the Messina Strait. And from an ancient Roman amphitheater, you can see Mount Etna right there. It's absolutely magnificent. It's a very popular tourist attraction these days. Now, this is uh, what they call the advance through to and through the Foggia Plain from Sicily. So this is where we cross at Messina. The British Army is coming along up the toe of the boat to the heel of the boot. And this is basically the division responsibilities, especially as they get further up the boot. There's a spinal mountain system known as the Apennine, and typically the 8th British Army would be to the east, the US Army would be to the west. And I gotta tell you too, if the Germans wouldn't have lost, that, they were concentrating on those formidable defensive lines, but this is where we're at our least organized. It's not a big track of land for several tens of thousands of troops. And it's, a, it's really, really congested. And we can't wait to go up north so that we can fan out and shake it out. There's another picture that'll show you what I'm talking about. The Canadians were the vanguard. That is to say they led the British division. And the purpose of a vanguard, for those of you who don't speak military jargon, is they're the guys that will locate and fix the enemy, define what they are so that the division commander, brigade commander, whatever the case may be, will determine how to tackle that problem. So they played a critical role in going from Sicily up to and through the Foggia Plain. In opposition came mostly in the form of Italian soldiers surrendering by the hundreds. 
Uh, on 8 September, the Italian government surrenders to the Allies, and in the surrender's wake, German troops retreat to intercept the Allied advance. It's very, very, very rugged terrain, and Campo Basso, again, for those of you who may not be able to see, is right here, and it's, this is the area here now where the fighting starts to become very, very intense. And now the Germans are starting to show their stuff. Uh, by the time we punch through the Foggia Plain and we start making our way north, this is when we introduce the 5th Canadian Armored Division and the 1st Canadian Corps Headquarters arrives. Just to take care of a little bit of the lingo, um, a regiment will be about 800 all ranks. And then from, you'll need typically three infantry regiments to form a brigade. And then inside that brigade, you'll also have likely a tank regiment, artillery regiment, and combat supporting arms like medics and the logisticians. Three infantry brigades will provide you with an infantry division. An infantry division is about 10,000 troops. That's the basic formation that generals would use when they planned out big picture stuff. And then of course, uh, more than two divisions would present you with a core. So this is where we're at now. Very, very significant time for the Canadian Army. The picture to the right is actually a soldier that Grant and I know. Uh, this is up in a place called Col Danchise. Remember I was telling you just south of Campo Basso, that's where the fighting really starts to intensify. And you can again look through that hole and that gives you an idea of the terrain. I really like that picture to the left because it now shows you where we're going in march formation. And march formation is typically done in column. It's an administrative thing. It's the easiest way to control masses of troops. But as you get closer to the fighting, you've got to branch out into an assault formation. And this is, I love this picture because it shows the makeup of uh, one Canadian division. And you'll see in the bottom column there, it shows you the first, second, and third brigades. Of those nine regiments, there are only three that have remained on the regular Army Orbat. That's the Royal 22nd Regiment, Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, and the Royal Canadian Regiment. Now we're going to approach the Moro, the Gully, and Ortona, otherwise referred to as the Adriatic Sector. Winter rains had turned the landscape into a quagmire on 6 December. Canadians assault the Moro defenses. Only the Princess Patricia's Canadian Infantry breaks through ahead of its brigade and the Div to take a place called uh, Villa Rugati before it's ordered to withdraw. The problem is in warfare you can't advance too far because now your flanks are exposed to counterattacks. And if you blow it, you've now compromised your brigade or larger formation. So they had to pull back. A firm bridgehead was established across the Moro River but further advance was blocked by a deep narrow pass nicknamed the Gully. Repeated frontal assaults by uh, multiple battalions were cut to pieces. And then on the night of 14th, 15th of December, a company commander by the name of Captain Triquet, um, he managed to really impress and motivate his company and they outflanked the Gully. And that scene was at a farmhouse referred to as Casa Berardi. Paul Triquet was the first Canadian in Italy to win the Victoria Cross for valor. After four more days of fighting to gain vital crossroads, the Germans withdraw from the gully and into the town of Ortona. Up to Ortona, there were several counterattacks, and you could, the Canadians could always count on that. And then there's a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat. The thing the Canadian soldiers learned long, long ago before they even got that far was to have as many shovels as they could in their platoon because they always could bank on a German counterattack and that included tons of 88 millimeter uh, artillery and their barrages were vicious. On 20 December, the Loyal Edmonton Regiment and the Seaforth Highlanders of Canada, who are still stationed out of Vancouver, supported by tanks of the Three Rivers Regiment, become embroiled in vicious house-to-house -house fighting in Ortona with a German crack first parachute division. Finding that the advance along the streets is impossible, Canadians blast their way from house to house using a technique known as mouse holing. What happened was before the Canadians get into, could get into the town of Ortona, 
Uh, the Germans do a lot of demolitions, bringing in the houses of these old brick homes and to, into the streets so tanks and guns can't use them. And in fact, even dismounted troops can't use the streets. So that's why they blow holes from house to house to house to advance towards their objectives. There was no pause for the fighting, even on Christmas Day. The C 4th quartermaster managed to organize a sumptuous Christmas dinner. Uh, one by one, companies would go back to a church on the uh, Ortona's outskirts and they were served a traditional Christmas dinner, then would return to battle. The loyal Edmontons and most tankers had no such reprieve. Not until the night of 28 December did the Battle of Ortona end with a German withdrawal. The December fighting cost over 2,600 Canadians, including over 500 killed. There were, over, there were close to 4,000 evacuations for battle exhaustion and over 1,600 for sickness. Out of a total Canadian strength at the beginning of December at about 20,000, all ranks. For information, this exceeds the Normandy casualty lists. The 1st Canadian Infantry Division really battered up and bruised two German divisions in achieving its objectives. Um, following the battle, there was what was known as the Ortona Winter Line. Uh, still many, many casualties and further op offensive operations came to a grinding halt. There was lots of patrolling. By now, Canada peaks its theater strength up to 76,000. So this is the Moro to the right. Now have a look at that valley. You can see forever. I've personally been there. You can see forever. So you're at risk. You're at risk going down the near slope. Then you've got a river crossing to do and then you've got to fight your way up the forward slope. Point to note about this, river crossings, Canadians, uh, combat engineers became very, very good at it. You had to be proficient and you had to be fast. Because every obstacle, a ridge, a river, they're all gullies, they're all obstacles, and they're always covered by view and covered by fire. So the engineers are very good at it. In fact, kudos to the Canadian combat engineers because uh, there wasn't a lot of roads in terms of local infrastructure, so they built a lot of roads. Signage is very important. You might notice the, uh, the play of words there. I don't think they really meant chit. <laughs> it's a hunch. Uh, so, and the signs are very important too. The symbols that they use are very specific as to who is supposed to use that road and who is supposed to be at that bridge or that uh, water crossing site. This is where Triquette had earned his Victoria Cross, supported by a wonderful company of Van Dues. This is Village Abadi. This place here is a point to note, is not only where the second brigade headquarters was, but today it's a wonderful little restaurant and they serve wine by the buckets. <laughs> uh, now we're starting, we're on the outside of uh, Ortona. Again, the state of the roads going in Ortona. Now look at this picture. When I first saw that picture, I thought that spineless platoon commander is hiding behind one of his troops. Not the case. If you look a little closer, there's a radio handset in his hand and on his back, he's got the radio. The platoon commander's actually taking orders from his company commander, and he's using that soldier's radio pack to write orders and to mark his map. This is, as they're approaching Ortona, you'll notice the streets are fine. There's a tank. This is gonna be a very, well, it's not gonna happen. The tanks are not going in because all the streets are blown up with rubble from the blown up buildings. This would be common from uh, throughout the battle for Ortona. Um, and and the ex again, the Canadians got very good at emergency rescue. Here they are extracting a guy. Well, typically what the Germans would do is as they, as they saw the Canadians closing in on them, what they would do is they would booby trap the building. And uh, in one such case, the Loyal Edmonton Regiment came close to losing a whole platoon buried into a building that was blown up. With nice contrast pictures there. To the left, typical scene in Battle Torn Ortona. And then of course, lovely picture of a typical street in Ortona today. Uh, this is the St. Thomas Cathedral. To the left is what it looked like after that battle was done. and that 
to the right, that's a picture I took in uh, either 2013 or 2018. This is a medieval castle of Ortona and uh, the German withdrawal route is just in behind that castle and they follow the coastline in along here. It's the only way they could get out. They couldn't have a withdrawal route on the mainland because the uh, allies had punched through and they'd have been in hot pursuit. So that was the quickest way they could get out of town. And then if you can make it out on the writing to date, few of the buildings that survived are still pockmarked by uh, ammunition. And then you'll see that there's a warning that there's an actual allied curfew as of uh, 2100, that is to say nine o'clock. Now why on earth is that sign so high up? Your average guy, especially if it's just gigantically tall as I am, isn't gonna see that unless he's looking for it. Well, I'll tell you why. Because the, underneath the stenciling is how high the piled rubble went up to. So they just climbed up on top of the rubble and that's why that writing is so high up on that wall. Here's uh, Seaforth having a great Christmas dinner. Um, I can tell you more about how the soldiers ate in, in the campaign. We can do that during the Q&A. In a lot of cases, Canadian soldiers ate better than the Canadian soldiers in Britain. Why is that? Because in Britain, they were rationing their food. That's why. Mail is a big, has a big role to play in, uh, in maintaining morale. This is the Teatro Vittoria, built by Mussolini and his fascists when Ortona was liberated. The Allies turned it into the Red Patch Club. The Red Patch is in reference to the one Canadian division shoulder patch. So that's why they called it the Red Patch Club. Why am I telling you about this? And by the way, wonderful insights there. It's because in uh, 2013, the mayors of Ortona and Edmonton put through what they call a proclamation of friendship. That's because Edmonton no longer does twinning of cities. So there's the mayor of Ortona, there's the Edmonton city rep. This cute little old lady here, when she was a young girl, etched out a living by doing Canadians laundry. And she remembers her biggest heartbreak was when the soldiers wouldn't return to pick up their laundry. They were either killed in action or dragged off to a mash unit way back. Wonderful gal. On 1 June, um, they renamed this piazza and they, currently now it's called the Piazza of the Memory of the Canadian Heroes. This here's the Price of Peace monument that we saw on the opening title page of the presentation. This is the Mayor of Ortona. This is the Minister of Veterans Affairs and the Canadian Ambassador was there too. So a great deal of uh, debt to the Canadians from the citizens of Ortona. Now we're going to talk about breaking the formidable Gustav and Hitler lines. They're about uh, 10 kilometers apart. And um, this is the biggest single day of fighting of the, in the Italian campaign. This is essential because this is the gateway to Rome. That's why it's so important. The thing about the Gustav line and the Hitler line is the defensive systems are bristling with well-concealed pillboxes, machine gun bunkers, tank turrets, uh, gun emplacements tons of barbed wire and minefields, all built on slave labor. Um, you'll see this is the Gustav line, this is the Hitler line. They no longer call it the Hitler line once it looks like the line is going to fall because they don't want to embarrass the fewer. Eventually they take Rome at the Melfa River. Uh, there was a great resistance there and there was a major Jack Mahoney who was awarded a Victoria Cross for defending a small bridgehead. One Canadian Corps resulted in about 800 dead, 2,500 wounded, 4,000 sick, and 400 battle exhausted cases. Meanwhile, attention was shifting towards France. The Allies invade Normandy on 6 June. Italy becomes largely a forgotten theater of war, derided as D-Day Dodgers, the rank and file soldiers fighting, uh, transformed the term into a, a mark of pride. Again, this was the single worst day of fighting. And that's reflected by the Casino Cemetery, which has 4,200 Commonwealth graves, of which 200 are unknown, 855 Canadians, and there are 192 Canadians that have no known grave. This is the Leary Valley from the Monte Casino perspective. There's Monte Casino to the top. This is what it looks like. This isn't even at the top of Monte Casino, the Abbey. It could give you an idea of the vastness of the uh, valley. 
There's the destroyed casino abbey. We can talk more about that during the Q&A. This is a Polish cemetery with over a thousand dead. The Polish had to take this mountain, and by the way, this picture is taken from the abbey. They had to take those two mountains so that the Germans no longer had that superiority of uh, artillery and observation. Here's a Soviet buried at the Casino Cemetery. And for the same reasons, they sent Soviets as we did officers and NCOs to North Africa. Here's a couple of bunkers. Here's a flower pot made out of a German machine gun turret. This is a, a monument laid there by Canadians at Aquino, part of the Hitler Valley. This is a wonderful painting by Charles Comfort. Lots of his work is at the National War Monument. This is a ceremony at uh, Frozenoni. The uh, Loyal Eddies are accredited with liberating it. That monument is at a site of a platoon commander that got killed in a patrol because they were flushing out Germans and before they could take it. This is the Gothic line. And they got to take the Gothic line. And this is an example of the vastness. Great tank country and observation country for artillery fort observations officers. This is the Gradera Castle. And, the, near, and this is, and it can't be all work, so here's a little donkey rodeo by the Loyal Edmonton Regiment. This is the Rimini line. Rimini is essential because to the north is the Po Valley and the Lombardy Plains. And that's critical because that's where there's factories and lots of vital supplies to maintain the war effort. So they got to take that. This is uh, the Rimini perspective. That's uh, San Marino, the Republic. That's the lengthy beach at Rimini. When the Allies got to Rimini, the Germans left it undestroyed. That's still a 2,000 year old bridge that they drive across. Souvenirs, young men are great souvenir hunters. Uh, to the left is a sketch off of a dead German paratrooper. And to the right is a certificate of service that belonged to a German paratrooper. The Romagna, Briefly, in a nutshell, the Romagna is essential because uh, now you're starting to close in towards Florence and Venice. These are the dikes that they got of every river. Every canal has those dikes. Canadians would have a lot to learn by the use of dikes to prevent flooding. This is now the winter time. Offensive ops are coming to a grind, but there's still lots of fighting. It's intense and the casualties continue to climb. This is important. This is at the Revenue Center. This is a whole air crew buried together. Historical perspective, Palestine Regiment. Star of David, though the state of Israel has not yet been born, uh, Jews are forming battalions to serve with the British. Propaganda, everybody was using it. To the left is a German propaganda leaflet, and it's basically trying to convince the Canadians to give it up. We're just being lackeys to the Brits, the Americans, and the Russians. And of course, we've got propaganda leaflets of our own. Here's a safe conduct pass for any German that wants to turn himself in. Easy come, easy go. Very poignant message. To the left is a leave pass. He's in Paris. A month later, here's a telegram to his parents indicating that he's been wounded. That can lend the average soldier's mindset. This is a nobleman's estate from the 1700s used as a former German headquarters, and then eventually a Canadian field hospital. I'm going to leave you here, and you can read this during the Q&A. These are two poems written by loyal Edmontons. The one on the left is written by Lieutenant uh, Keith McGregor, and the one on the right is written by uh, Sergeant Tom Phelan. So in summary, I just want to tell you this, that after a short stand down, one Canadian Corps starts to withdraw from Italy in February to rejoin the Canadian Army, not seeing the conclusion of the Italian campaign. They eventually go into liberate Netherlands and to go into Germany through France. Of the 92,557 Canadians who served in Italy, 26,254 became casualties there. Over a thousand were taken prisoners of war. <laughs>